pretty much an animal has to die before the Animal Welfare Act kicks in, which is pretty much too late. Since 2010, when Don Brancho was killed by Telecom at SeaWorld, the whole debate about whales and dolphins being in captivity has changed. The industry struggling to justify itself, and that we are now the majority, and that's very new, and something to encourage to keep moving forward. We have to grow the majority and basically marginalize the industry now. There's the sort of bigger picture effort, which is what I'm involved in. And then there's the individual effort. Lolita, Morgan, who's the orca in Europe, Corky, who's the other resident whale from the Pacific Northwest who's still alive, Tilikum. There's the individual focus, which any grassroots activist might have. They have a special connection with a, a specific whale and they want to help that whale. So there's that level, and then there's the bigger picture level where we're, we're fighting for all the whales, for all the dolphins, for all the belugas. So what we really need to do is change the law so that it's clearer, it's less interpretable, it's less discretionary, it's more mandatory. And it clearly, we need to change it so it clearly gives the government authority to enforce that standard because the government feels that right now it doesn't have that authority. I disagree with them, but it's a matter of debate, so we need to change the law. If you, as a member of the public, ever has the sense that an animal isn't in good health and the facility is not taking good care of it, you can file a complaint. And then the Animal Welfare Act requires all complaints to be investigated. So then the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service, which is the agency responsible for enforcing the Animal Welfare Act, would conduct an investigation. It would go and inspect the facility without warning. It would be an unannounced uh, visit. And they would inspect the facility, inspect the animal. And these are veterinarians that conduct these inspections. So they would investigate the complaint. The problem with that is if the problem that you saw, whether it was a wound that wasn't healing well, or a dolphin looked thin, or you saw a fight between two animals and one of the animals got injured, if that problem isn't happening right when the inspector is there, it doesn't matter what evidence you have, video, photographs, doesn't matter. They are going to ignore it and only go based on the inspection they gave. And if at the time of the inspection everything looked good, they're going to say, hey, everything's fine. It's a real problem with the way the, the system works. It takes too long between the complaint and the inspection. So the facility has time to clean everything up. The government agency responsible for care and maintenance standards is the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service of the Department of Agriculture under the Animal Welfare Act. That's, that's the case. That's the law. And my point is they recognize that those standards need to be updated, and they're not doing it. I have told the government, I have said, that's your standard. That's the definition you've chosen. They're not meeting it. You have the authority to do something about it. You have the authority to say, we're going to pull your permits or pull your license because you're not meeting the standard. And their response is, no, we don't. We don't have that authority. And again, I could take them to court over that, but it would be very difficult for me to get standing. It's not possible to force the issue because we don't have the ability to file a lawsuit in court to force the issue. I think we're very close to having a number of state laws that prohibit the public display of certainly orcas and possibly even all cetaceans. And once we reach some critical mass, and I don't know what that is, 12 states, 15 states, 25 states, at some point that will be a critical mass and the federal government will follow suit. 20 years ago, uh, the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service under the Animal Welfare Act started to reconsider its standards for things like water quality tank size, all sorts of things. And uh, they got together a bunch of stakeholders, including myself, so the animal welfare people, the animal rights people, if you will, and the industry, and a couple of academics. They got us all together in a room, and they tried to negotiate changes. We came to consensus on half of the provisions of the standards, things like how much experience a trainer had to have, how much experience a vet had to have. We came to consensus on those things. But when it came to the real stuff, what does the water quality have to be like? What do the facilities have to be like? 
how big does the tank need to be, we couldn't come to consensus. So the government agreed that they would do what's called a traditional rulemaking. They would just come up with something and propose it. We'd all get to comment on it, and then they would finalize it. That was 20 years ago, and we're still waiting. So the standards that are currently in place for things like water quality and tank size are now 30 years out of date. They haven't been updated since 1984, and that was back before we knew a lot of things we know now. All right? The science has advanced. Those standards are completely outdated. The government knows this. They're supposed to update them, and 20 years later, we're still waiting for that update. To say that that's ridiculous is really an understatement. It is absolutely ludicrous that we're still waiting for a proposed rule on tank size, water quality, upgrades to the standards. So and this is part of the problem. The government is just terrified of publishing any proposed rule because they know the industry will hate it. We'll probably hate it. Everybody will hate it. We'll think it's too weak. They'll think it's too strong. Now, the good news is, is for the first time in forever, the government, the legislative arm of the government, is aware that the executive arm of the government isn't doing its job. So there's actually been some pressure from Congress on the Department of Agriculture to do its job and publish a proposed rule that updates the regs. And we'll, we'll continue to put pressure on them. They have to publish this rule soon. You would think that the public display industry would have conducted lots of studies on what the animals actually need. Like, if they're in this size tank, they do this. And if they're in this size tank, they do this. And this is closer to natural behavior than this. So really, we should be building a tank this big. And this should not be allowed anymore. They haven't done it. They've been holding these animals for more than 50 years, and they haven't done this research. Why? Because they don't want to know the answer. So basically, there should be a lot more research than there actually is, because the industry does not want to pursue this research. They need something different than what they have. Either the tanks aren't big enough, or they're not deep enough, or they're not cold enough, or they're not uh, complex enough, you know, they're, they're boring. Or, there's something wrong with the way they're being held now because all of the metrics we have to measure their welfare are poor. But exactly what they need, bigger, deeper, colder, something, we don't know because the industry won't do the work. They don't do the research. The care and maintenance standards under the Animal Welfare Act require certain things um, to keep the animals in good health and to prevent cruelty. And as I mentioned earlier, um, I don't think the Animal Welfare Act is, is adequate. I think it's weak. Um, cruelty is not allowed. So in terms of the methods they use to train the animals, they can't use punishment. They, you know, can't use physical punishment for certain. Um, all of them claim to use operant conditioning with positive reinforcement anyway. Most of them actually do use that method. It's the same method you use to train your dog or your cat. It's perfectly humane. The question is, are they in fact not feeding the animals before a show so that they're good and hungry? So that the food is a strong positive reinforcer? To me that's wrong. They shouldn't be doing that. But they may do that. That wouldn't necessarily be illegal because in the end, by the end of the show, they get their full food complement. But to me it's gaming the system a little bit. If you're actually if the animals are hungry and you're not feeding them when they're hungry, you're waiting until the show to feed them. I don't think that's cruel, but I think it's unethical. You know, these animals live a long time, so if we retire any of them to sanctuaries, they're potentially going to be there for a fairly long time. 30 years, 40 years, maybe even 50 or more, um, depending on how they adapt to a sanctuary. So they're going to be there for that length of time to transition the public from expecting them to be performing in shows to understanding they don't deserve that. Understanding what they need is their own lives and their determination of their own lives. That they need their own autonomy. That they need to be left in their natural habitat. We're giving not just the industry time to transition away from shows, we're giving the public time to transition away from shows. For 50 years we've expected Shamu. And now I'm hoping we can transition into a a society that doesn't expect that, a society that understands these animals have their own purpose in life, 
their own fates, their own goals, their own thoughts, self-determination. And so I hope we can take those 20, 30, 40 years when these animals are finally retired in sea pens, in sanctuaries, to transition everybody away from these very um, utilitarian and domination type expectations. We deserve to have them in a box so we can watch them do things. Um, to, no, no, they deserve their own lives in the wild.